policy. It's an honor to be able to introduce our speaker today. Robert Oscar Lopez is an assistant professor of English and classics at California. <laughs> a tenured uh, professor at English, uh, of English and classics at California State University in Northridge. After receiving his Bachelor's of Arts from Yale in 1993, Professor Lopez worked for Hispanics United as a bilingual court advocate and then as a translator paralegal, and paralegal for a law firm in New York. He went on to receive his PhD and master's degree from State University of New York. By 2013, he was made a tenured professor at California State Northridge where he has been an active writer and commentator in conservative circles, publishing extensively in venues such as American Thinker, Public Discourse, Daily Caller, Ethica Politica, The Federalist, and most recently, the peer-reviewed publication, Humana Review. His focus shifted to concern, concerns for children's rights, a topic on which he wished to combine his personal experiences, as he was raised by a lesbian with the help of her lifelong female partner, and the broad interdisciplinary research he has conducted into the research into the history of family structures. In 2014, he was appointed president of the International Children's Rights Institute. He has testified against same-sex marriage in Minnesota and wrote an amicus curie brief for the Supreme Court in the Obergefell versus Hodges decision. Please join me in welcoming Bobby Lopez. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for bringing me here, and thank you so much for coming when it's sunny outside, and you all, um, I know, would rather be outside in the sun. I really appreciate it. This is my second time being at Notre Dame, and um, it's always a, a pleasure to come here. Um, I'm going to try to, um, to uh, um, really take the question seriously of what next for children's rights, um, because in the year 2015, it was a huge year. Um, it was a bad year for children's rights because of the particular way that Obergefell versus Hodges was decided. Um, and I think for people who take children's rights advocacy very seriously, uh, there are two things that are really important. One is, is to move forward. I don't think that we, I think we want to avoid re-litigating the gay marriage cases um, because we really have to focus on the collateral damage that Obergefell did in terms of the way that the law and the culture has changed the views of children. And the second is we really have to work very hard to distinguish between two different movements that both call themselves children's rights movements. One movement is um, one that I would say typically argues for children's rights as a way to take away parents' rights, right? And that's the one that I'm not part of. Um, they often, you know, advocate for things like sex education for kindergartners, et cetera, because they say the child has a right to sex education, and they override the parent through the child, okay? But the children's rights movement, which really found its biggest um, impetus in France in 2012, is the one that I am part of. It's a very international movement, and it is rather looking very closely at relationships, um, at what um, is the relationship between the child and uh, the society, people, the individuals in society who have obligations to that child. So even though we talk about children's rights, our version of it is really a movement of obligations. It's about what uh, responsibilities or duties do adults have to children, okay? And it's in that vein that we have to, I'm just gonna briefly go over what Obergefell versus Hodges did um, and then I can talk about what uh, I and other people on the International Children's Rights Institute really see as the next big um, battlefield for children's rights. Okay, so what the Supreme Court decision did was first, um, it established that the 14th Amendment could mean that people have a right, a constitutional right to the recognition of social relationships. That's fairly significant. That's something different from um, the way that uh, our culture and our law have, have typically defined rights, and especially sort of innate rights. It also implied that the 14th Amendment means that people have a right to children as long as they satisfy a numerical minimum. That is to say, if there are two adults who want a child, they have a right to have a child in their home, okay, um, and without regard to gender. And the third is that the Obergefell versus Hodges decision accepted the equivalency of race to sexual orientation and therefore of behavior to essence. And while that doesn't look like it bears immediately on children, it will, as I will illustrate in a little bit. Okay, so those are, I, 
In my view, there are a lot of things that happened in the Obergefell decision, but those are the three very important things that came out of that, all right? What did the Supreme Court decision not do? And I think what it didn't do is just as important as what it did, all right? Number one, it did not include the relationship between citizens and their mother and father as something protected by the 14th Amendment. If, in fact, the whole impetus behind this decision was to say that the Constitution protects relationships, the decision was noticeably silent as to whether the relationship between every citizen and the two people who conceived them and gave them their genetic identity is a relationship that has any constitutional importance at all. That was um, avoided um, very scrupulously by the, um, by the court. Number two, it didn't address the 14th Amendment rights of children at all. And that's important because the lower courts did in a, in a kind of sideways way. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And the third thing is it did not apply the equal dignity standard to mixed orientation marriages. And this will also be important in a second. If, in fact, a main impetus behind Obergefell versus Hodges was the equivalency between sexual orientation and race, and if a lot of the historical precedent for it came from the history of laws against miscegenation, there, it's, it's noteworthy that the court did not make any statement as to whether a marriage between a heterosexual and a gay person also has equal dignity to a marriage between two straight people or between two gay people. Do you understand what I mean? That that was also something that was avoided by the court. And that's going to be important as we talk about some of the, the big issues that come next. Okay, so what was the role of children in Obergefell, all right? Um, the equal right to parent children, the idea that you have an equal right to have children to, who love and obey you in your home, whether or not you are the genetic parent, that right played a major role in the cases leading up to Obergefell. How many of you know about the case DeVore versus Snyder? That was one of the cases that was being decided. It was a Michigan case. And that one, the lead uh, plaintiffs in that case were two lesbians who had each individually adopted children. And they argued that they needed to have marriage because marriage alone would give them automatic custody over the other child, their, their partner's child, okay? But Obergefell almost entirely sidestepped the research, okay? The lower court cases there were, um, involved a lot of debate. In Texas, there was a lot of debate. In Virginia, there was a huge debate. In Utah, there was a huge debate. But Obergefell basically did not comment as to whether um, they found merit to either side of the research question as to whether children benefited or flourished um, with same-sex parents as opposed to their natural parents. The social science research was very established by 2015. Between 2013 and 2015, a lot changed. In 2013, when U.S. versus Windsor was decided, uh, there was only one major social science research study that had produced uh, results that implied that there might be negative outcomes. That was the Mark Rignaris study, which had come out about six months beforehand. But by 2015, almost all of the big major studies that came out after it that had large samples were actually indicating a, a pattern of negative consequences on children raised in same-sex couple homes. Um, uh, Walter Shum had published additional research um, after the 2013 decision um, showing about the abuse rates in foster care homes um, and the identities of the parents. Douglas Allen had done a canvassing of 20% of the Canadian census and he produced uh, results that showed that the graduation rates of children of same-sex couples were significantly lower than the graduation rates of children raised by a mother and a father. And then most importantly, Donald Paul Sullins, who not only uncovered the fact that a lot of the former social science research was faulty, um, but also he came, he, came, he came up with the important finding that the welfare of children in same-sex couple homes decreases when the gay couple marries. Okay, and that was an important finding because that matched a lot of what I had found in, in um, compiling testimonials from the people who had grown up in gay couples' homes. Does everyone follow what I'm saying? It was a very counterintuitive thing. He found that uh, the people who had the highest rates of crying every day, the people who felt the most afraid, the people who felt the most nervous every day, 
were the children who were being raised by two gay adults who were married to each other under the marriage laws, okay? Now this matched a lot of what I had been compiling in the testimonials because um, I, coming from English, I recorded people, I, I tried to coach other people who had been raised in gay homes to write their own stories down. And what we found was very often the non-biologically related gay partner of their parent. They usually had one of her people in the couple they considered a parent, the other one they considered their parent's boyfriend or their parent's girlfriend. That other person, the step-parent figure, was often a source of a lot of anxiety in children's lives as they lived them. And it made sense to me because when, the, when they marry, all of a sudden that gay partner gets a lot more power to dictate things to that child. And so it makes sense that the child would feel more emotional distress, okay? So a lot of research had uh, been established and all of this was presented to the court. One of the things that changed between 2013 and 2015 was also the boom in testimonials from people who had been raised by same-sex couples. The book that I'm going to be reading from a little bit today, Jeff's Daughters, was submitted to the court, and that had 70 different narratives of um, adults who had been raised by same-sex couples. Um, six adults independently authored amicus briefs to the Supreme Court to oppose same-sex marriage. These were adults who had been raised by gay couples. Up until that point, and even to this day, children raised by gay couples who are um, pro-gay marriage have never written independent briefs. Their testimony has always been compiled and excerpted by lawyers who represent the gay parents. Do you understand? So a lot had changed, but the decision completely ignored all of that. Um, uh, all of that, the, the only thing that we had that I could say was a reference to this change in social science research and this change in all the information we had was that just, um, um, Justice Scalia, who is now dear and departed, um, he did make one mention in oral arguments when he was disputing things with the lawyer who was in favor of same-sex marriage, saying some of the amicus brief seems to point to the fact that there are negative outcomes, all right? Justice Kennedy, during the oral questioning, basically said, I don't believe any of the social science research, and he said he wasn't going to follow any of it. Sonia Sotomayor, um, got into a very testy exchange with the lawyers and said, there is no way that marriage actually keeps fathers in the lives of their children. She basically made a statement to the extent of, because the lawyer was saying marriage um, keeps fathers in contact with their biological children, and she says, it does not do that on any level. Elena Kagan said, the ultimate goal should be to find more homes that are available for adoption. And so she basically took the line that um, it would be a, a, a social good for the whole country if there were more gay married couples because there were more people who would be able to adopt. But that itself also overlooked a lot of the statistics on adoption. Okay, so um, coming from this, this was a pretty severe um, uh, judgment and it had a huge impact Again, this is not even talking about you know, the morality of homosexuality or anything. This is, these are huge changes in the way that children's identities are defined.